Welcome back to the Leaner Together series, episode two. I asked you guys over on Instagram what you wanted to see in this series, some of your guys' responses. So Nicole, Katie, Grace, Bella, and Kylie all wanted to know more about how to have balance in your nutrition. I'm gonna be using my fitness pal because that is the app that I'm the most familiar with. My sister invited me to dinner tonight and I really wanted to go to spend quality time with her, but I know in the past I could have been easily deterred from going because I didn't know how they cooked the food, exactly what the ingredients were, or how to even freaking track it to prepare for going out to eat. So I would have secluded myself and said no, because it would have been too hard while I was dieting. So what I did to pre-plan was to go ahead and put in some of the meals I was gonna eat before that I went so I could figure out how the allotments needed to go. So I have meal one in because I knew I was going to eat the exact same breakfast. And where I am within this dieting phase, I know that I have enough room to easily eat my first and second meal. And those are my two favorite meals. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in my second meal here. And I'm gonna go ahead and scroll to the bottom. If you see that I have six meals and maybe you're my fitness pal, just says breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. If you go on the desktop version, you can go ahead and change this to just six meals. And this really helps me out with making sure my meals and snacks are in here in the way that I prefer. Here in meal five, you'll see something that is a rice cake with peanut butter and raspberries, and that's something I eat alongside my lunch. Then coming down to meal six here, you'll see me add in some hash browns, which is something I eat with my breakfast as well, but I wasn't regularly doing that until recently, so I had it separated from the breakfast. And then I also have in here a fruit bar because I was going to train earlier and I was feeling like I needed a little bit of food, so I went ahead and had that bar. So now if I go ahead and click and look at my macros for everything that's been laid out, I've hit 88 grams of protein out of the 150 I'm aiming for. So I have 62 grams of protein to still hit. I've hit 146 carbs of the 225, so I have 79 more carbs. Then I also have some leeway here on fiber, as well as fat, as I have 29 grams of fat I can still do for the day. But the restaurant that we're going to is a steakhouse, and if there's steak, I'm gonna have some steak. So what I did next was go ahead and look at the menu for the restaurant. This is something I recommend to so many of my clients. Again, just taking five extra minutes to look ahead at the menu and make sure that you either can track it or just have an idea of what you're eating so you can plan accordingly for your day if maybe you're not tracking as specifically and taking a more intuitive nature. Looking at the menu and when I went down to their main dishes, I saw that they had a filet mignon. As well as when we're looking at the different meats here, there is also a strip and a ribeye. And a ribeye is gonna be much higher in fat because it's a much more marbled piece of meat. Now, I do enjoy having some fat on my steak, but I actually prefer having a sirloin or a filet, and that is gonna be a little bit lower fat. When it comes to eating out, it's not just about getting the thing that is the healthiest on the menu or the absolute leanest cut of meat. It's about figuring out your preferences and how to make them work for the goals that you have. So I see that their filet is six or an eight ounce, and then that's also gonna come with some roasted carrots on the side and a demi-glaze. Now, anytime there's a glaze, a dressing, or a sauce, I always ask for it on the side. By being able to control the amount, I normally end up putting a lot less than what they would have put on if they put it out on in the kitchen. And so I'm able to also control my serving size. So going back to my fitness pal, I'm going to head on to my meal three, and I'm going to look at how to go ahead and track this meal. So I'm gonna type in the filet mignon, and I see here the USDA choice, and that's what I'm gonna go with. And there's oftentimes going to be a little check mark saying it's a verified food, but you can also look online to make sure it matches up. If I am searching for something on my fitness pal and I'm not sure if it's the right answer or if it's the right breakdown, I will look it up on Google or I'll look at a few different nutrition labels online to make sure I have the right thing. 
With tracking the filet, that ended up being 12 grams of fat and 37 and a half grams of protein. But I know I wanna have sides with it too, and I know it comes with carrots, but looking at a few of the other sides here, I also see they have fries on the menu. And let me tell you, I love me some fries. And based on my preferences, I would take a leaner cut of meat or chicken to be able to have fries. That's how I would personally go about it because I love fries. With going out to eat, again, you don't know exactly how they cook foods, but I will tell you, I worked in restaurants for quite a few years and they are pretty generous with the oil. So I always overestimate what it would be if I were to cook it at home. So if I were to have a filet and cook it at home, I wouldn't be using a ton of oil or butter. So this could be a very accurate tracking for what that filet would be. But I'm going to go ahead and assume it either comes with oil or butter on it or it's cooked in oil or butter. Then I'm also going to take what side I am thinking I'm gonna be getting, which is going to be the French fries, and making sure I track for that too. But like I said, it can be so frustrating to search French fry or to search carrot or whatever it may be and trying to figure out what exact one really fits. So I'm gonna let you on in the best hack that I have when it comes to tracking and eating out. So when you go on my fitness pal and you hit add food, you can actually just type in carbs and that is going to give you the carb macro. So instead of having to track each individual ingredient, you can go ahead and take a guesstimation at what this is. Now, of course, getting good at guesstimating comes with practice. If you feel unsure, take a guess and make sure that you keep growing and building upon what that is. You can also use something like your hands for measuring. You can use this quick guideline to be able to showcase how to go ahead and track food with your hands. So what I'm Going to go ahead and put in here is I'm going to go ahead and put in 45 grams of carbs and this is going to allow me to have some roasted carrots as well as the carbs from the fries that I'm planning to have as well but it does not count as fiber when I'm just tracking the carbs. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and type in fiber because the carrots are gonna give me some good fiber as well. So if I put in the five grams of fiber, that fiber is actually now gonna be tracked as carbs. So if you think something is around 50 grams of carbs, like I think it is gonna be in this case, then you wanna split it between those carbs and fiber depending on what that breakdown is going to be. Next up is gonna be tracking fats. And again, I'm always pretty generous when it comes to fats of overestimating or just leaving extra room when it comes to fats. So the steak is already tracked, but these fats are gonna account for any fats that would be on the French fries, as well as any oils that they might be using for cooking. I'm gonna put this at 15, just because I'm not starving going into this meal. So I don't think I'm gonna eat a ton of fries, but I will have the carrots because I love roasted carrots as well. So I am just going to go ahead and track this as 15 grams of fats. But again, when it comes to tracking and eating out, I always recommend overestimating on fats because that is the one really tricky one and the one that starts to tick up a little bit higher when you do go out to eat. Of course, you can ask if they don't cook it in oils and use cooking spray, but you don't know if this is gonna be followed to a tea or again, if maybe they marinate it in something or it's just left over on the grill. So I always think about being safe than sorry. So now when I go back to my fitness pal and look at the breakdown, I went ahead and had this meal at 27 grams of fat, 50 grams of carbs, and 37 and a half grams of protein. So when I look at what's left for the day, I see I'm out of fats, which is what I expected. And that's why I decided to track the meal I was eating out first. This is another pro tip I would give you here is any time that you are pre-tracking, think about the meals that you want to have no matter what first. So for me, that was my breakfast and lunch where I really wasn't willing to budge on either of those. And I did know that I had some leeway to make sure I still could have those meals. But then it came to tracking the meal out because then I could make my third meal around that. Even though I was eating it before the steak meal, I could make sure that I had enough of the macros to build out what I needed. So with this breakdown of really just protein and carbs left, my go-to here is going to be a protein shake. So I'm 
gonna go ahead and track a protein shake with some Legion protein since that's my favorite. And since I have some carbs left, I'm gonna go ahead and put in some cereal because I love me some rice checks as well. You're finding out all of the things I absolutely love. And I'm gonna put some strawberries in there because I will likely be having this meal after I train. I love having fructose and of course carbs in place after I train and I just love fruit in general. So now when we go ahead and take a look back at my averages, we see I freaking hit the mark on the head. I am one off for my protein, zero off for my carbs, and zero off for my fat. So I'm super happy and this allows me to go eat a meal out with my sister, really enjoy it, be present, still have french fries and a steak, but still be able to hit my goals. One thing I wanna make very clear is I did not starve myself going into this meal. This wasn't even considered a free meal, but even if it were, I wasn't gonna be not eating going into the meal. And as you can see where my calorie amount is and where my macro amount is, I'm not being shy about what my meals are. A lot of my meals are four to 600 calories each. Even if one of my meals was going to be a protein shake and some carbs, it just was how things laid out that I had a little bit less fat to give to that meal because I decided to have red meat. Again, I could have made a different choice based on the menu and my preferences, but I took my preferences in line with what my goals were and married them beautifully. And it allows you to go into the situation stress-free, which is exactly what I was. I didn't worry about what I can and can't do and trying to monitor everything that I ate. I knew the game plan. I went in, I ate, I had a great time, and I'm still on track to hit exactly what I want to. Welcome back to my desk. Each week, we're going to take time to look over physique photos and look at the data around the diet to give you guys an inside look at exactly why we're doing what we're doing. We'll start with looking at our overall adherence and the scale trends that we saw alongside our physique photos. Let's hop in. On the left-hand side, you're going to see my personal tracker. And so that you will see my starting weight was 221.6 pounds and I ended the week at 220.2, giving me an average weigh-in of 220.5, which is going to be a 1.1 pound fat loss for that first week. My goal was to be within one to 1.5 pounds of fat loss during each week of these first six weeks of the diet. Now, I think that my progress could have been even greater if I had greater prioritization of some of these different factors that I did not do such a great job with. That one factor is going to be my sleep. You will see that I averaged just above six hours per night, which is not good. I should have done better, and this is always going to play a very large role in our ability to lose body fat, as well as having quality energy, having quality digestion. All the things that really impact our ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis is going to be impacted by our sleep. And so by me not having the quality of sleep, whether it be quantity or quality, is going to hinder my rate of overall fat loss. This is going to be something I need to have a greater prioritization going into future weeks weeks to allow for myself to be in that one to 1.5 range each and every week. Things that I did well are going to be my adherence to my nutrition. I was almost spot on calorically day to day there, as well as my average steps over the week. So those were two main components that were big positives for me, as well as getting all of my training in that did allow for me to still make solid progress when we look at scale readings, as well as physique photos here in a little bit. Now, when it comes to Sue's progress, the one thing that we want to acknowledge and make sure that we have an understanding of is that her cycle was during this week. And so with her cycle being in place, the scale readings are not going to be a large indicator of success or lack thereof during this period. One thing to pay attention to is large fluctuations in the scale. This is going to be an in increase or maybe a decrease in overall inflammatory response, which is going to be common during a female's menstrual cycle. During a female's menstrual cycle, the things that we're already prioritizing on a day-to-day -day basis, your digestion, the quality of foods that you're taking in, your rest, the quality of your sleep, 
get to be even a greater priority because they're going to have an even greater impact on how your body is going to respond. So if you're getting really poor sleep during your cycle, it's going to affect you 1.25 times the amount that it may be impacting you just on a regular basis. So if you are a female and, and on your menstrual cycle, it is a time in which you really, really, really have to bunker down and prioritize the things that are going to maximize your rest. When we look at Sue's adherence, she had a very solid week. Now, coming back to the menstrual cycle, this can impact digestion, as I said. And so if an individual is experiencing greater bloating or not having as strong of an appetite, I am going to encourage them to have quality of nutrients, make sure that they're uh, getting in their protein, but not pushing it to just simply hit the macro allotments that we have in place just for the sake of doing so if they're already in an uncomfortable position. There was an evening that Sue needed to get in more food, but she was having a little bit of stomach discomfort and bloating. And so she decided to have more of a snack. And that's going to be reflective as you see within her weekly adherence that her calories were a little bit down overall. She's going to be able to correct this as her menstrual cycle has concluded and her appetite as well as her digestion has gotten back into sync. Sue did a great job with her steps as well as getting her training sessions in, hitting her water and controlling the controllables. Neither of us are going to be making adjustments going into week two. We're keeping the protocols the same and continuing to have consistent effort amongst all categories to continue to see the fat loss that we desire. I put together some side-by-sides from the start of the diet to the conclusion of week one so that we can take a look and see some of the differences that I see from a coaching perspective between the two photos. We're going to have an easier time seeing the changes in my physique relative to Sue's, not because of gender, but simply because I have more body fat to lose than she does. I'm also just a larger human, so the changes in inflammation or water as well as glycogen are going to be a little bit easier to see. Let's get started with the front facing photo. And the first thing that really jumps out at me when I'm looking at these images is going to be the glycogen loss in my quads and more specifically through my right leg here. And so you see, this is my initial photo, and then you can see that the glycogen has really dropped off between these photos. The, the muscle belly has shrunk down. It does not have as clear of lines, and it certainly is not as full. This is a great sign for us that I'm burning through that muscle glycogen and making my way to really burning the body fat that I want to. This is also reflective in the side profile. You can see the same situation where in my quad here, I'm going to be much more full, and then as I look at the most recent images, it's almost as if I've lost my quads in general. And it's not that I lost any muscle tissue, it's simply that I've lost the muscle glycogen and now we're getting to work on that body fat that I desire to lose. This is going to be reflective throughout my entire body composition. You can see the same thing through my arms and my delts and through my traps, but the most abundant and easiest to see is going to be those quads. If you look at the side profile and compare these two images, looking at the left to the right, I look a little bit more like a melted candle on the right. This is another great sign for us that body fat or glycogen loss, I should say, is transpiring. I'm not having as much glycogen or carbohydrates being stored in my lat. I'm losing some of the density and lines that I see there, as well as through my midsection, where I'm losing some of the, the shape and lines through my obliques and through my abdomen. All great signs that we're on the right path. Now let's go ahead and take a look at Sue's photos. I want to reiterate that the differences are not going to be as easy to see on Sue relative to myself because of the total body fat differences, but there are two that I would really like to illustrate to you. And so let's look at the front facing photo for her. And the one thing that I want to draw your attention to is going to be her delt fullness. So this is going to be, again, glycogen coming down and allowing for us to see that we're really on the right path. So you can see here that the fullness, especially in this left delt, is going to be lower than her initial photos. Again, we're on that right path. And when we go over to the side profile, you're going to see a little bit of distension through the lower abdomen. This is a really, really important observation to make for many individuals when they are on their menstrual cycle. The reason being for this is that that lower abdomen is going to be a common place for inflammation to kind of hang around. Now, that is not saying that you cannot have body fat in the lower abdomen, trust me. 
I've got it. But what we see oftentimes with individuals on their menstrual cycle is that that inflammation is really going to allocate itself to the lower abdomen, as well as she was experiencing some of that GI distress. And so if you feel that you have the stomach in a position where it's flatter towards the upper and mid portion, and then you have a little bit of a bump, if you will, at the bottom, this could be inflammation, it could be digestive stress, it could also be body fat, but I would start with those first two things to assess your overall rest and recovery as well as your digestive health and then from there be able to press forward with adjustments or what have you. It would be great for us to see physique photo changes week after week, but that's not always going to be the reality. We're taking physique photos to be able to compare them month after month and really see the changes that are made within the body. Week one is in the freaking books. What were some of the things that you felt went well for you in week one? I was really proud of the effort that I put in with food just because as I had expressed, I had been tracking rather loosely. And so being able to go into tracking a little bit more diligently, having to pre-plan and just having, I don't wanna say restrictions, but it just was more strict than I have been. And being able to figure out what mindset I needed to be in to continue to be successful within the diet. Diet. Now there was one day that I fell short on food and then a separate day that I fell short on steps. And I wanted to talk through kind of how I handled those situations coming up or what even happened during those. So when I fell short on food, it was actually due to my cycle. I was having pretty bad cramps and I had actually pre-planned everything. But then when it came time to the day going on and when it was time to eat, I felt really uncomfortable and it was getting close to bed and I had to make the decision, do I go ahead and go to bed and just under eat today or do I eat, which is gonna cause me to stay up later because I needed to have time to digest the food and then go to sleep. So I chose something in between those two of just having a snack and then choosing to call it for the night and recognizing that what I do 90% of the time matters a lot more than what I do 10% of the time. And it's very seldom that something like my period cramps are gonna stop me from accomplishing what my goal is. So I had to have a little bit of of grace with myself, even though week number one, I wanted to be perfect, wanted to be 100%. I made the decision of I'm just gonna have a snack and go to bed, and I believe that was the right decision for me to make. Do you always want to use trial and error? Have you tried one thing? Maybe that wasn't the best. All you can do is learn from it and move forward. The solution that I came up with was knowing that around my cycle, my cramps can sometimes make it hard to eat all of my food, and so being able to move some of my food over to things Things that are gonna be easier to eat, like maybe move to a smoothie during those weeks of just knowing, hey, that's gonna be easier to get food in, but can't change anything about it now, just making the decisions moving forward. And stepwise, it was just the right decision to not keep trying to get steps in. I was just uh, a thousand steps shy and decided to make it up the next day and was able to get that done and move on from it. I found myself in a situation where I was getting to the end of my work day and I still had four or 5,000 steps that I needed to take. And so this week I've done a better job of dispersing my steps with smaller walks incrementally throughout my day. What are some of the things that you're wanting to work on going into week two? I think the big thing is just continuing to build on week one. I know that that's a very boring answer, but I am really happy for the most part of how sleep went. I'm happy with how food went. I would say that one thing from food would just be finishing my food earlier in the day. I know with our days, and it's kind of the same circumstance, but then the steps for you is we're ending our work days possibly a little bit too late. Then we're trying to stretch out when we eat that last meal because we want to eat it together. And then we're eating a little bit too close to bedtime. And so I would say that that's one big thing just throughout this whole entire 12 weeks that I need to work on because I know it's been something that I have been dropping the ball on with a little bit but I am extremely happy about how I did with the different rules and tenets that we put in place. So I thought that since we are getting into the beginning of this, we won't repeat this every week, but being able to talk about what these core tenets are for ourselves. And there's also going to be story graphics that you can follow along. So they're gonna be on the physique development page and you can message either one of us to be able to get a blank screenshot of them as well. But number one was following a structured dietary protocol. So check. 
Check. <laughs> One hour of outdoor activity with the doggos or kiddos. We actually knocked off both of those even without having kiddos, so <laughs> check. Check. <laughs> a minimum of 8K steps a day, which on average, I will say, check. Check. <laughs> One house chore per day, and you know, I feel like this whole series is really going to help me get stuff done around the house because I am competitive. And so when you say one, I'm doing five and I'm starting to get things done around the house that I feel really good about. So one house chore a day, check. I did one, I did not go competitive and go five, but check. <laughs> and then taking progress photos weekly, which you will see those are check. And then resistance train a minimum of three times a week. And I think we both got four times, so. Go us. We also got a yoga session in and it was a really great one. Alex did two, I did one. I would like to give you that credit. <laughs> as well as one weekly date, which we did this as well. And then the last thing is one thing a day for self care, which definitely was a check. I don't know if I checked this one. I feel like I missed this a couple times, but I hit it more days than I didn't, I would say. That's a wrap for week one of the Leaner Together series. If you have any questions on what we discussed today, leave us a comment below and tune in next week as we'll have a full day of eating. Make sure you subscribe and we'll see you in the next video.